Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege for me to be here with you all and to be able to share what God has for us today. Uh, my name is Luis Cardoso. I'm a Brazilian living in the UK for the last 12 years and has been a great journey, has been amazing what the Lord is doing. And I'm here uh, in India with Brother Kimi. I would like to thank the pastors for the warm welcome to allow me to be here today. And we pray for you. And I'm really, really happy to know what God is doing with the Dream Center. And I'd like to say that we really want to bless. I don't know how. We'll speak later. But we really would like to be together on that. Because that's what the Lord does. The Lord put families together. The Lord put people together that never met before. But we're family. And family help each other. Family pray for each other. Family spend time with each other. We never met, but when we meet and we start to talk, looks like we know each other for years. And that's what the Lord can do. And we are here uh, to launch advanced groups. And advanced groups are a tool that, to help the church, to enable the church of Jesus Christ to know Jesus and to make Him known. Our mentoring groups of people that will walk together, talking about Jesus, bringing back to the basics of the gospel, and sharing Jesus with the world. It's not about technique. It's not about strategies. Why? Because we believe that the best person to teach that he's the local church about strategies and techniques are the pastors of the church. It would be very arrogant for me to come from the UK a Brazilian living in the UK and say, oh, I have the answer for the community in Hyderabad. No, we don't. But Jesus does. And Jesus reveals to the angels of the church, to the pastors of the church, the right strategy, the right technique to win this community. But advanced groups are for Christians to go on this journey and support the vision that the Lord has given to the pastors. Is this group of Christians that will go on the first four months of this, of this group, of this session, just to go back to the basics of the Bible and understand that it's the Word of God. And then goes to uh, people that do evangelism in prayer that moves on the power of the Spirit. And then from that, we'll go and talk about accountability, how to be accountable to your pastors, to your leaders, to people that God put in your life about your spiritual life but about to do what is asked to you to do in a way that is asked on the time that is asked. And then talking about people that do evangelism and you stir the church. Because you know what, Pastor? I hope that we don't have this problem over here. But in the UK, sometimes when people start to evangelize, some evangelists and some people, they just go rogue. They think they are in Indiana Jones of faith. And... <laughs> They start to criticize the local church and they say, and they just go to evangelize. And let me tell you, true gospel evangelism, a godly evangelism is rooted in the local church and happen under the blessing of the local pastor. That's what advanced groups are all about. To go and serve the local church, stir the local church to go, prepare the local church under the guidance of the pastors to receive new Christians. At the same time that we all mobilize and help and encourage each other to go. So we are here to launch this. Brother Kimi will be sharing with the pastors of this church. All our material are free. The books are free. Everything is free. And then people ask, so why on earth you are here? We are here because we are family. And family share with each other. Bless each other. Encourage each other. Like I was tremendously encouraged today. And let me tell you, Pastor, I need to say that. Up front, I will steal this idea of the Dream Center. And I'm moving very, very soon to Glasgow. And I really like the idea to have a Dream Center there. Maybe a sister church, a sister Dream Center in Glasgow, right there in the UK. Because we serve a Lord that He doesn't see borders. We created that. Men created that. He sees everything as His backyard. And we all as His children. So that's what the Lord does. Today I would like to share with you a message that I believe comes from God's heart to you and to me. Because we are called to change the world. That's your call. We are Christians, guys. The first 
way that we were called was the people that put the world upside down. Are the people that go to the shopping malls and start a revolution of holiness where people will feel drawn and welcome to godly centers, dream centers, and they will meet God there and be transformed. We will talk today about the call of the Lord to our lives to preach the gospel, to share the gospel, to live the gospel. And the text that I would like to read for us today is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. And I would strongly recommend that you follow in your Bible, because I don't want anything to get missed on my uh, accent. Because remember, English is not my first language, I'm Brazilian. So actually, I learned Portuguese, then Spanish, and then when I was an adult, I learned English. And sometimes my English puts me in big trouble. I remember the first sermon that I preached when God sent me to the UK was in the island of Guernsey. And I preached about commitment to the Lord. And you know what? The word for commitment in Portuguese is compromiso. That writes almost identically as compromise. So I typed on the Word document and it fixed my compromiso to compromise. And I preached the message, you need to compromise with God. And I preached the whole morning, my first service, everyone in the church trying to see this young, crazy Brazilian pastor. And I, I was young at the time, 12 years ago. So I was there and I was preaching, guys, it's time to compromise our Christian values. It's time to compromise with the Bible. It's time to compromise. And people were looking at me and I was thinking, British people are very cold. <laughs> they don't really react to the gospel. And, you know, and we went to the moment, I would like to do a prayer moment in the end. And I said, so if you want to compromise, really make a decision today. I'll compromise with all that the Bible says. Come to the front. I want to pray with you. Be brave. No one came. And I was thinking, they're very, very cold. They need me here, Lord. And then I looked to my wife. You know, like pastors do sometimes, like no one was responding. And I look at her like, please come. And I said, if you want to compromise your marriage, with your marriage today, come to the front. Maybe the Lord is calling your marriage for a, a new season of compromise. Come to the front. And she did to support me because she also thought compromise is compromise, so commitment. And no one else came, so we cried and we prayed. And yeah, it wasn't very good my first service, so I need to confess that. But so if, if you don't understand something, I pray now that the Lord may give you uh, an understanding or put in the chat or, or somewhere that Brother Kimi will help. He speaks Portuguese now in Jesus' name. He will help with the translation. But uh, so let's dive in to Timothy chapter 4. The Bible says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in the view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Father, this is your word. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit may touch our heart and may transform our hearts in a fertile land to your word. We know that one word from you, Lord, can transform our lives, can transform and redeem Hyderabad, and India will never be the same again because God spoke and everything comes into existence when we speak. So, Lord, we pray, speak to us. If there's anything that is only from my heart, I pray. I beg you, Lord, remove it now. 
No one needs anything from Louis alone. But we need a word that comes from the living God. So touch us and bless us, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Guys, I, I would like to share a little bit about myself just to give a, a context of, of me. I grew up in Brazil and I wasn't a believer my entire life. I grew up in Brazil as an atheist because my, both of my parents and their families, they went to Brazil after the Second World War uh, because of the Second World War. And they went to Brazil, they were in crisis, they didn't believe in, in God, they didn't believe in anything. So the first time that I actually heard Jesus and the gospel for the first time, I was 15 years old. I never heard before. And when I heard the gospel, my parents put me and started to explain how that was just a myth. That wasn't true. So when I was 18 years old, I got married. My wife is a blessing, Danny. And one month after I got married, the deal with the pastor that made the, the, the wedding was, I, he would do the wedding, but I had to go to this retreat with him a month after our wedding. So on the day of the retreat, I woke up early and I was leaving the house one hour early than what was normal. And guess who was on the gate? The pastor. He said, I knew you would do that, Louis, so you have a choice. Or you go with me or I'll follow you around like a ghost. And I wasn't a believer, so I was a little bit scared of, of ghosts. So I said, all right, I'll go with you. So we went to this retreat. And three days, nothing made sense until the last moment when, for the first time in my life, I had an encounter with the real God. And I had an encounter with this real God, and I went back, and I went to the pastor and to people in the church, and I said, guys, you don't believe it. God is real. And they look at me like, yeah, we told you so. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. God, the creator, God, this uh, most powerful being that we cannot even describe, he is real. And then they look and they said, yes. And I said, look, how can that not make a difference in your life Monday to Saturday? How can just make a difference on a Sunday morning? God is real. He's real. And I was doing business administration on the best university of the region. I, I had a business. I was working on a bank. Life was going as I planned. But I said, you know what? I don't know what that means, but I'll drop everything because my Purpose in life is to help people to understand believers and not believers. God is real. Don't take that lightly. Imagine God, this being that brought the whole existence, not just the planet Earth, not just Hyderabad, but the whole existence. Thousands and thousands and thousands of galaxies. You know, you can travel millions of years in the light speed and not even get to the middle of what we know of the universe. This God that made all that with the power of his voice is real. And he's here today and he's knocking at the door of our hearts. And I said, I need to let the world know this. I need to go and share with the world this truth that God is real. And they look at me and they said, okay, if you want to do that, go to and do theology. So I did. I went and I did this pre-theological course because I didn't know anything about anything on the Bible. I didn't know. I, for you, just to have an idea, uh, I remember I took a friend, a, a woman to the church, and when she came, someone came and said, peace of the Lord. And in Brazil, Lord and lady, you know, men and women. So when someone came and was a man, a deacon in the church, and said, the peace of the Lord, I look at her, and I reply, the peace of the Lord. And I look at her and said, you have to say the peace of the lady, because you are a lady. And she said, the peace of the lady. And we thought we were Christians. <laughs> Amazing. We didn't know anything. So we had to learn. But on the end of that first year, I did, and I, moved, I would move to Sao Paulo to study theology, a uh, uh, degree in theology. And on my way there, I was in the bus with my best friend, Eva, and we, he was discipling me. He was my best friend. We were really bound together. And I, we were in the bus. The bus was completely full. When we went to buy the ticket, he said, Luis, I had a dream. And the dream is that uh, we had an accident with the bus. So let's be wise how we buy the seat. So from all the buses, all were full, and the only only two places that they had was either the first two seats or the back two seats of the bus. 
Yvonne wants to go to the back, and I said, no, let's go to the front because I don't sleep. So it would be great if, we can, uh, if I can watch the road. So we bought it. We were on our way to Sao Paulo. I was talking to the driver on that time. We could speak to the driver in Brazil. And he said, just go inside. We are five minutes from the stop, and I don't want anyone from the company to see you. On these five minutes, he fell asleep. And he, uh, the bus collided with a truck full of wood. This truck, uh, this bus was 44 people uh, inside. 41 died straight away. 41 died because when the bus collided, pieces of wood from the truck that was broken and stopped on the corner of the, the, the road just flew inside of the bus. I remember only, I was in the first seat, I remember when a, 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 a man came to me and shook me up and said, hey, wake up, the bus is on fire. And when I woke up, all those pieces of wood had destroyed like a bowling. All half of the bus was just shaking because it was still on and was pieces of the bus on fire. And that man said, jump the, the window. And I did. And when I fell on the, on the tarmac on the other side, I was only on my underwear. I was all, I lost pieces of muscle on this leg. I was all bleeding. I lost a, a piece of my teeth, and I was like, what is going on? I thought I was dying because I couldn't breathe. I, I was in such a state, and when I looked, I saw the driver, and he, less, he lost both of his legs on that accident. And, and I knew he was dying as well. So I went there, and I said, do you know Jesus? And he said, I've never been to a church before. I said, I'm not talking about a church now. I'm talking about Jesus. He said, no. I said, so let's talk to him because we're going to meet him very soon. I led him to the Lord on that moment. He surrendered his life. And as I saw that his, his breath was coming to an end, I said, man, I, just talk to him and hold to his hand. And I need to speak to him because I thought I was dying. So I walked on the side of the bus. I just collapsed. But I, I still conscious, and I was, Lord, how is Ivan, my best friend? And Lord, if, if I'm going home, that's fine, I'm ready. But you know, I have a wife, and I have a kid. And, 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 and I left everything, Lord. Just take care of them. And I know you do, because you love them more than I can ever love them. And on that moment, I heard God's voice, as I never did before. And God spoke to me and said, Louis, don't worry with Ivan, because Ivan is with me. Ivan is home. And Louis, your life as you know it ended tonight. You're supposed to be dead now. But you will live my life from this time on. From this time on, you will go to places that you never dreamed or heard about. Like Hyderabad, for example. You will meet people that you wouldn't meet otherwise. And you will preach the gospel in the four corners of the world. You will do that because my life is in you. And you know what? That's the call of every Christian. You don't need to go through a, a big accident to understand that. When we surrender our lives to the Lord, our life is no longer ours. Our money is no longer ours. Our family is no longer ours. Our business are no longer ours. And it's such a privilege to be able to invest in what is God because all belongs to God. But some, some people are hard to learn like me. So we had to go through this traumatic event. And I was there on the side of the road, knowing that my life would never be the same again, knowing that my best friend had died, and I could see the uh, emergency service taking everybody out of that bus. That traumatized me. That changed me. After that, I faced periods of depressions and panic attacks. That's for another message. That was really hard. But the most epic moment of this all was when I could borrow a mobile phone from someone and I made a call to my wife. Because I knew that the news were there, they would go to the news and, and they would start to speak because it was a major accident. You know, many people died and my wife knew that I was going to Sao Paulo and they would be desperate. So I took that phone and I called to my wife. And when my wife answered, I knew I had 20, 30 seconds to speak to her. So I just said, I am okay. But Ivan died. And I couldn't speak anymore. 
I couldn't speak anymore because I knew I had told her all that I could at that moment, but that was the most important thing that I could say. And as I was trying to breathe, I, I was trying not to cry, I was trying not to collapse, I was trying to focus, I just said the most important thing. I'm okay, I'm well, but Ivan died. And then he started to cry on the other side. She said, what happened? I know you. What is happening? I had one shot to say what I wanted to say. And I made it the most important message ever to my wife. When we read this text in 2 Timothy chapter 4, that's exactly what was going on. The apostle Paul, he was dying. He was in a dungeon. Lewis, but he was always in prison. Yes, but he was in the dungeon, and he knew that was the last shot. That was the 20 seconds message that he had to give to someone that he loved. And Timothy was someone that he loved as a son. So he had that 20 seconds message, and he wrote this. Lewis, how do you know that Timothy was the, uh, the Paul was dying? Just go with me if you want to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. He says, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. He knew he was dying. He knew his time has come. And he, write, he wrote to his son in faith and said, I have only one shot, so I will make the most important thing. And he said, and that's few things I would like to say to you. Because as we prepare to go to the dream center, guys, we need to understand this message. Because I think we are going to times where India will be shaken by the Lord. But remember that every time that the Lord shakes a nation, the devil also comes and shakes with persecution, with problem, with difficulties, with COVID and many more things. So get ready to the message that is really, really important from the Lord to us today as we go to this epic, new, unique time in the life of the church in India. Paul said, I give you this charge. Preach the word. I give you this charge. And then he just makes an introduction that was very common in the name of God and Jesus. Normal introduction. Preach the word. But the theologians, they agree that actually we could summarize this in, I give you this charge. Preach. But when we go to see, I give you this charge, preach, we need to understand how people would have understood at the time because they didn't spoke English or Telugu or Portuguese English like I speak, that is not English or Portuguese, is this mix that is horrible. No, they spoke Greek. And on that time, uh, when they heard, I give you this charge, was actually one word. And the word was, or as close as a Brazilian can say in Greek. So this word, the armatoromai, wasn't a, a Christian word, really was also used by the judges and the courts of the time. And how it was used, was used when someone had a proof that could release someone from a penalty or even the death sentence. So let's imagine that you have a friend and, and, and he... I don't know, he did something horrible. He, he stole all the sandwiches of the family or, or he did something and, and this person was being judged and would go to jail. And as the person was being judged and going to jail, you found something that could save the people's lives or save the people from that penalty. So you would go to the judge and say, I give you this charge. I have a proof that will save this person's life. So what Paul is trying to say here to Timothy is, hey, Timothy, preach the word because your message will save people's lives. Your message will transform people from inside out and will transform them on this life and for the whole eternity. I passed through an accident to understand that my life is no longer my own, but he's, we don't need to. What we need to understand is we have a charge from God to us. The dream center is not just another location. I feel that in my spirit will be a place where God is giving us a charge. Let's preach. Let's share. Let's do it. It's important. Why? Because the gospel has lost none of its power. It's still the power to save. Greek Jews... People from Telegana, from Delhi, from Brazil, from everywhere. 
God is still God. You still have this commission in your life. John Wesley, a famous reformer from England, said, You have nothing to do but to save souls. That's our main and only task. Whatever we do, we do because of that. Oh, Louis, but my call is to be part of the worship team. Hallelujah for that worship. Lead people to Christ. But don't forget, we are called to save souls. John Bunyan that wrote The Pilgrim Progress, the books that sold more than any other books on the planet. John Bunyan was in jail for 12 years for the privilege to preach. And every night, a commissioner would come to his jail and said, Look, John Bunyan, if you agree that you will no longer preach because you are a troublemaker, you are putting the world upside down, we will release you tonight. And he said, Look, if I leave jail tonight, I'll preach tomorrow morning with the grace of God. We have this privilege. We have this privilege. You know, one day I was praying and I was saying, Lord, but I just need something. And, and, and I really felt in my heart God speaking to me this, saying, Louis, you know, one day you will be before me. And you will see me as I see you, face to face. And when you are there, I will not ask you how many houses or cars or degrees or whatever else you got it. But I'll ask you, my son, what did you do with the generation that you lived in? Louis, what did you do with the gospel that you received? Louis, what did you do with the crown and the people around you? Were you just exactly like them, pursuing the same human passions and richness and all that? Or were you being image and likeness of me? Guys, don't get me wrong. I'm not here saying that it's easy for me. I'm, 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 it's not. I would like to be here saying to you guys, I'm, we are here with Advance because I'm the best evangelist ever. I go to the toilet and people accept Jesus. That doesn't happen. And by the way, to be very honest with you, I'm, a, I'm not a good evangelist. But you don't have to be. What we, God doesn't call us to be amazing evangelists. God calls us to be faithful to Him. To have holiness, to pursue holiness. I was sharing with Kimi uh, yesterday. I went to preach on this conference about evangelism in Germany a few years back. And I was the next person to be speaking on the platform. And when I was there waiting my time, the previous guy that preached was leaving. And then, you know, when preachers are almost leaving, but they come back to say something. And I don't know why they do that. But uh, when, when he came back, I wish he didn't because he came back, took the microphone and said, hey, I just want to share a testimony. I came on the airplane and I was praying, God, I don't accept to leave this airplane without winning a soul. So that was my prayer. In the whole flight I was, Lord, why no one sat on my side? I would share the gospel. So he went to the bathroom, uh, to the toilet on the airplane multiple times until he finally shared the gospel and led two people to Christ. And he was, so don't ever go to the airplane in the same way. And guys, I was the next one. And I was thinking, my whole prayer on that day was, Lord, I want to fly alone. No one on my side, please. Lord, I don't want to speak to anyone. Lord, I just want to put my headphones and just be, no one knows me. No one speak to me. I just want to be by myself, enjoying and I was like, oh, why did he have to come back and share this testimony? Guys, this is life sometimes. But advanced groups are here to remind us that we have a charge to preach. But preach starts when we know God so deeply that overflows. And that's what I'm here to do. But then he continued, and that's the point too. Preach, but not just preach, but preach in season and out of season. Preach when it's easy and when it's hard. When you are a child, when you are an adult, or when you are elderly, preach. When you have a pay rise or when you are fired, preach. When your girlfriend accepts to be your wife and the families agree, or when you don't have a girlfriend, <laughs> preach. Preach when Dream Center is open and then, amen, the dream is coming true. Or when we still meet you online, preach. The fact is, if we are waiting for something to preach, probably we will never find what we are waiting for. 
If we are waiting for everything to be perfect to preach, we'll preach on, on, on heaven. And let me tell you a good news that you don't need to preach in heaven because everybody knows the Lord there. But preach it here, in season and out of season. But to understand what they understood with this text, we need to know that when they heard in season and out of season, man, they were under complete pressure and persecution on that time. This text was written between 67 and 90 uh, uh, um, after Christ. And we need to understand that in 68, so two years before the, the end of this uh, text was written, uh, Rome was on fire, and from the 12 neighborhoods of Rome, 10 was completely destroyed. And guess what? The emperor put the blame on Christians. So the whole Roman Empire were persecuting Christians and killed them, killing them. Then the Jewish people were also persecuting Christians to the point that if they found a Christian and they gave them to the authorities, they would have a reward. The agnostics were against Christians. The Gnostics were against Christians. Everybody hated the Christian community. To the point where if you were accused, you would go to jail. You could be killed just for the accusation. And if you were accused once and proved to be innocent, you would receive a card saying he is not a Christian or she is not a Christian. And you would use that to authorities if they ever accuse you again. Persecution is not something new to Christianity. It's not. But today, we need to understand one thing. Whoever loves his life will lose it. Do you want to find real life, real joy, real peace? Live for the glory of God. <clears throat> not for your good name. Not for your good fortune. I'm not saying those things are wrong. What I'm saying is that there is only one place that is the first place in your heart. And that belongs to the Lord. Or should belong to the Lord. He doesn't share his glory with anything else. In season or out of season. I really feel to say to you today, guys, maybe we are afraid of the persecutions in India. And I don't want to start to begin to think about how hard that is. I don't want to, to imagine anything else. But what I want to say to you today is that Paul knew that he was dying because of the gospel. He knew that his son on faith could die only to preach the gospel. And his recommendation was... Don't put your self-protection. Of course, be wise as you go. But don't put security as a God or as, or, or as an idol in your life. Only God is the idol and God of our life. In season and out of season. In season and out of season. I remember when I dropped uni and, and business and everything else to go to, mini, to the ministry. People would look at me and say, you were crazy. You could love Jesus and keep doing what you were doing. I said, yes, but that is not my call. My call is something else. And that is the most important thing. Because that's the expression of my relationship with the Lord. I love him and I do what he asks. That's the deal. Your deal and your call may be different, but let me tell you something. Don't use... The season that you are in as an excuse for inactivity. In season or out of season. And he continues. <clears throat> because we are the sound doctrine preachers. Guys, we are called to share the sound doctrine. 2 Timothy chapter 3.16 says that all scripture are inspired by God. All scripture. All. Don't choose and pick what we like. We are in a moment. Do you have any doubt, my brothers and sisters watching from home or here? Do you have any doubt that we are in a moment in history where people are finding teachers that say what they want to hear? The Bible says what their itching ears want to hear. People that don't hold the truth. They cannot really live for the truth. They just... Cannot cope with it. So they find a preacher on TV or YouTube or somewhere else that will say what their itching ears want to hear. And let me tell you, it's not just because it's written in a book that is right. It's not just because a pastor said something that is right. It's what the Word of God says that is right. And even if everybody else disagrees. We are called to preach the sound doctrine. We are called to preach what the Bible says. Hosea 
4, 6 says, my people suffer because they don't have enough knowledge. What is your commitment with the word? We are not called to preach our opinion. We are called to preach the gospel. We are not called to preach what we think, but what the Bible says. Oh, Louis, but I don't agree with what the Bible says. Tough. I remember once I was speaking to my dad and I said, Dad, I don't agree when I became a Christian. I said, I really don't like what the Bible is saying here. I prefer what something else. And my dad is a very wise man, very sweet man. He looked at me and said, Louis, if your opinion was important, it would be on the Bible. <laughs> Just follow what the Bible says. And I said, okay, that's a good advice, yes. The truth is, we, another day I was praying, and God is also amazing. And he, the way he speaks to me, I'm very hard to listen. Sometimes it's very direct, so I was praying. I said, God, you know those days, speak to me, Lord. I really need it today. Speak to me, speak. I want to hear, I want something tangible, something spiritual. And God said, Louis, you are so hard to listen that I left written for you. It's called the Bible. Read it. And when you read it, you will find me. It's my story. It's my revelation. It's me there. 8,000 promises. 365 times. Don't worry. Don't give up. Just read it and listen to me and encounter me on those words. You don't even need to go through all this thing. With, just go there. I'm there. I said, wow, that's true. Do you know how many people died for us to have the Bible in our own language? How many people lost their lives translating this and, and, and dying because of this? The Bible is the base of our lives and the base of our rock. That's why when we do advance, we spend the first, the first four months just talking about evangelism in the Bible, about our commitment with the Word of God, about how rooted we need to be. But when we enter in a dream center church, we need to support our pastors as never before. It's not about me and what the church will do to give me a good experience and help me to enjoy that time. It's all about what I can give to the Lord and, and, and how I can live what the Bible says we can live as a church. Let's go back to the Bible. And to finish, the Bible says, fulfill your ministry. Fulfill. Fill your ministry. Someone said, following Jesus is simple but not easy. It's simple but not easy. Love until it hurts, until it's complicated, and then love some more. I would say to serve Jesus, to serve God, to understand His charge, to serve the vision that God is giving to our local church, it's simple but not easy. It's countercultural. It's against our flesh. Serve until it hurts, until it costs. I don't believe in service that doesn't cost anything. That's not something that we see on the Bible. There is, that's not what I plan to say, but I really feel the Lord saying something here. That there is a theology that came from hell. A theology that says, oh, if it's too hard, it's not from God. Oh, you know, I'm trying to be part of the worship team. Or I'm trying to help the pastor. I'm trying to be part of the... But if it's complicated, if it needs to cost something, if it's oh, not easy, then it's not from the Lord. Because if it was from God, all the doors would be open. Read the Bible! Jesus was killed by his, because of his ministry. It's not easy. It wasn't easy. It will never be easy. And actually, what the Bible says is, be careful if everybody claps to you. Because they did that with the false prophets. So if you have resistance, hallelujah, welcome to the team. If they persecuted Jesus, they will do with us. If Jesus had difficulties, we will have difficulties. Paul, he was going to some cities and he couldn't. He was expelled, he was beaten, he was flogged, and he was put out. And then sometimes he wrote, and the Spirit forbid us to go there. Do you know what that means? They didn't allow us to go many times. Or I was trying, God said no. I was trying, God said no. And I was trying, and I didn't listen, and I was left. The thing is, today, there is a call from the Lord to you. Fulfill your ministry. 
fulfill your mission. I believe and I want to prophesy a time of growth on this church. This ministry will grow. We'll become an example to Christians, to Hindus, from people to other uh, 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 religion, as Christ is alive and transforming a community. I feel that in my heart, that all that you are putting with life skills and everything else will transform people inside out, and they, when they realize they will have an encounter with Jesus, not just have an encounter with God because they will see God in action. I believe this will be a new season for India, and it's starting here. But it will only happen if we all fulfill our ministry, if we all do our part, if we all go the extra length, with our finances, with our love, with our passion, with our service, with our evangelism. Then God will fulfill. Do you know, have you ever played with Lego? I wasn't smart, so I, I never played with Lego, really. I, 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 the only thing I could do was a box or, or, or a square. And I would leave on the living room, and my father would step, and he wouldn't be very happy after that. Because it can hurt, really, your feet. But, but the thing is, imagine the God the kingdom of God and the King Jesus there, but, but imagine God building his kingdom. Every one of us, we are a part of the Lego. A different shape, a different color, a different format. But the wall will only be complete if we are all in a place that we need to be. You don't need to be someone else. God is not calling you today to be Pastor Louis or, or Pastor or, or, or Brother Kim. God is not calling you for that. I remember when I became Christian, Again, I became a Christian. I was so in love with Billy Graham. And I was reading and I was studying and I was really decorating his messages. And I loved Billy Graham. And I was, wow. And you know, my father came to me, that sweet man, and he looked in my eyes. And another sweet moment, he said, Louis, if God wanted two Billy Grahams, he had made two Billy Grahams. If he didn't make two Billy Grahams, be Louis. I said, does that make sense? Thank you, Dad. And since then, I tried to pursue what God has for Lewis. What he had for Billy Graham was amazing, but it was for Billy Graham. And maybe if I try to do, it will be a disaster, because I'm not Billy Graham. I'm Lewis. Maybe if Billy Graham tried to do what Lewis did or does, it would be a disaster. I don't know. If I tried to be playing the keyboard or anything without related to worship, it would be a disaster. Thank God. He would really be thankful that I don't try. Praise the Lord, that's the body of Christ that only works if everybody does their part. But today, I would like to challenge you in the name of Jesus to fulfill your ministry. Don't say, oh, I'm not doing my part because of this person or that person or because it's hard. Don't say, oh, but uh, I'm not doing because, you know, it's right in the middle of my time of rest. Yes. We'll have eternity to rest. Of course, I want you to rest and have time with your family, but we compromise sometimes, the real compromise now, or what is important just in the name of other things. We find time for what is important. It's time to fulfill our ministry. And one thing that everyone has to fulfill is their call to evangelize. Their call to share Jesus. I'm not saying about phrases or these or that. I'm saying be friends with people. And in a normal way, share with them how good God is. We share cake recipes. We share when we find a good discount in a store. Let's share the reason of our hope, the reason of our faith. I would like to pray for you. I would like to invite our worship team to play something on the background if possible. And I would like to pray. I believe God wants to release an anointing in this place and in your life. An anointing is another word to describe the favor and presence of God and God releasing His favor, God releasing, manifesting His will and the power to accomplish His will in our lives. But God is asking us for a decision today. Will you decide to fulfill your ministry? Will you decide and make a decision today that, Pastor, I pray that today your phone will be ringing the whole day long with people saying, Pastor, it's time to serve. I'm sorry, I was not fulfilling my ministry. And the whole kingdom was 
suffering because of that. I want to do my part. I might be the little finger, great, but that's my call. Let's do it. And it's time for every one of us, of us to say, I'm here to share about the name of Jesus, to preach, because that can save people's lives. Hallelujah, Lord. I would like to put everyone that is watching us from home or from here in your presence now, knowing that you are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And when you give us a charge, you have power. Your power is over our lives to go, to make disciples, to fulfill our ministry, to preach the gospel, to be the love, the manifestation of the love of God in society and lead people to you, Lord. Father, I pray now in the name of Jesus, release an anointing of service, an anointing, Lord, of pe for two people to know you and to make you known in a special way, to go beyond ourselves, beyond our selfish desires, to promote the glory to you, Lord. We live to know you and to your glory and to allow people to know that. To commit is simply, is simple, Lord, but is costly. And today we say, Father, we want to love beyond our circumstances. We want to serve beyond what we were taught that was normal. We want to go the extra mile to your glory, to the redemption of this place in Jesus' name. Father, I bless this worship team, Father. I pray in Jesus' name, use them, Father. Use them. Impact India, Lord, through them. Lord, that the songs that they sing start to give new songs to them that will be sung and, and leading people to worship you in this place. Father, I pray and I bless the pastors of this church. Lord, I pray for a new season in their lives, a new anointing, new vision, a grace, Lord, work on their structure. And Father, that this new season they may find more favor, more anointing, more blessing, Lord, in a way that they will glorify you with many fruits. Father, I pray for a revival of holiness, for a new commitment to evangelism, and that everyone that is watching or is here today, it's saying yes to your charge to preach, yes to your charge to fulfill their ministries, and to do what they are called to do. Lord, if there is someone that is watching us today that is saying, I can't do it because I'm ill. Or I can do it because I have illness now in Jesus' name. Father, you are the doctor of the doctors. You are the healer. You are healing yourself. You are peace. Father, release healing now for people that are watching us. Now in the name of Jesus. People that are saying, I cannot do because I have arthritis or I have problems on my knees. In Jesus' name, receive the healing of the Lord in your life. Release people now, Lord, from a heart conditions. And as a result, they may glorify you and lead people to you. People that are praying and saying, Lord, I would like to do, but I have no condition. God is owner of the silver and gold. He is God. He makes and bring things from where there is nothing. It's not in what we can. It's in God's way. So Lord, now I pray for provision for this church. And I know that provision was already released to people that belongs here. That we may all contribute and bless and serve. Lord, I pray for advanced groups on, that we may help and encourage and support people here. To accomplish what you want them to I bless this place to find favor in the eyes of the politicians, Lord. Fav find favor in the eyes of the community in Hyderabad and beyond Hyderabad. And that through that we may give you glory and bring many people to know you. I bless everyone, Lord, that is watching in the powerful name and love of Jesus Christ. Amen.